Okay, I'm Sue Sparks. I was for many years uh, um, a head of education in a large mental health uh, learning disability community trust uh, in Yorkshire, in, in North and South Yorkshire. And uh, I had that post up until the 3rd of January. And then uh, I, since then, have come to work for uh, BPP as a part-time programme lead for the Masters in Healthcare Leadership. So I was asked if I would uh, do this presentation while I was still in my previous post because I've freelanced for a number of years for BPP. So I'm a nurse by trade uh, and... Uh, uh, but hi, but obviously an, ed an educationalist and then uh, uh, gained an honorary doctorate in 2015 for the, for the work that I had done. So when I was asked uh, about doing, um, looking at IT in, in mental health, I, saw, I spoke to Angela Granger, who was Director of Nursing for one of the uh, local NHS organisations, who had done the presentation last time. And she looked at it very much from an acute perspective. So talked about the day in the a life of a, of a patient and all the uh, IT equipment now and all, all the, um, obviously, observations that the nurses do around um, information technology. So I thought, well, what, what's different in mental health? Because we do have acutely physically ill patients. And if, they, if we do, they get shipped off very quickly to the acute trust. We don't have things like crash trolleys and, and, and things that they do in acute trust. We, we look after patients' mental health, not physical health. So I thought, right, OK, so what can I show you in sort of 25 minutes of what's different in, in mental health? So I made a list of all the things that we do in mental health that are IT-related, and I've come up with a few different ones that I want to, sh to sh just go through with you. So in the very sort of short time that we've got, they all really deserve a bit longer, but I wanted to give a really good... A good overview for you. So we're not going to be talking about IV cannulas or SATs or anything, although I am a, a, a general nurse. I just happened to end up in a mental health trust. Don't ask me why, but I did. Uh, so we're not going to do all that. We're going to, I'm going to, and I think as far as IT is concerned, mental health is probably a little bit behind acute trust, for, obviously for various reasons. So I thought what we would do is, if I can get this to work, ta -da. Um, those are the key points that I wanted to, to share with you. So just things around the changes that we've made using IT around mandatory training. Because in my role as head of education, my responsibility was very much around mandatory training. When I came into post in 2000, I came out of clinical practice in 2000, our mandatory training compli compliance was abysmal, and I mean abysmal. And part of that was because staff didn't attend, but they didn't feel that it was easy to access, and they felt very much around it being a, a, a tick box, really, something that they had to do to keep... Um, CQC happy and all the commissioning groups <coughs> happy and didn't really have any relevance to to them as uh, as staff. So I started to look out things that I could implement from, um, from an IT perspective very early on. So I want to talk a little bit about mandatory training to you and what we've, what we've put into place. Student learning is very interesting for me because I, I have been up until sort of this week when they, um, I said I lead on the master's course, but I've been picking up some of the um, mentor preparation. So this is qualified nurses and qualified, uh, I think we've got a couple of ODPs in as well. And how we um, monitor student learning within, within Yorkshire. It's been very interesting talking to the the newly qualified and qualified staff in London because it's very different. So you've got to bear in mind this is very much what we do in Yorkshire, okay, as you can tell from my accent. That's right. And, uh, and then I wanted to look at sort of some mental health recovery, um, what we're doing now for patients, service users around 
um, around IT. And lastly, I wanted to tell you about ramps, and this is really exciting. So I've left it to the last, and it is my baby. It's something that I've, I, I did my sort of parting shot, really, from the organisation. So I hope that will, will, will be OK. Um, as I say, I could talk for all day about each of them, but, <coughs> but, I, but I won't. So we use NHS electronic staff record. It's called ESR for short because it's a right mouthful. And it, it's got three functions. So part of it is an HR function. It has all the details on of the staff. Um, and it's interesting because BPP have that anyway, where I can look and I can see what my pay slips are and things. So we've got all that information on there. But the two areas that I was particularly interested in and particularly relevant to me was around the learning management system and around business intelligence. So all the um, mandatory training uh, programs are accessible for the staff via um, on, online. We still do some face-to-face. -face. I mean, I think it's difficult probably to um, teach resuscitation via uh, via e-learning, or how to manage a, a psychotic patient and get them into a secure area. I don't think you can really do that. But some of the, the, the other things we do, like information governance and updates, and since we've had the learning management system, we can monitor the staff. So the managers have what we call self-service rights, and they can see all their staff in their area and they can see who is compliant or, or not. But from a perspective of, being, of managing the actual education service, I could see everybody. I could see everybody and we could look at what their compliance is. When they were about to run out of date, we could inform them that they were about to run out of date, get yourself book, booked on. But the best thing to keep everybody happy, including CQC and our um, directors, was that we had business in intelligence. So we could pull off reports on a daily basis. And our compliance went from 33% to 83% when I left. And um, when we had our last CQC visit, which was about a year ago, that we had said to them that we will get compliance to 80%, and we did. And for me, it wasn't just about tick boxes. I think in the NHS, we're very good at ticking boxes. But from an education perspective, for me, it was about giving staff the knowledge and the skills that they needed to be fit for purpose, to be able to look after the patient, you know, look after my relatives, look after me, because it won't be that long before <laughs> I'm needing their, their care, probably. So, and, and look at it in a different way. Stop looking at it as a tick box exercise, but start to look at it as, this is your knowledge and skills that we are able to support you with. So, and it's a really, really good good tool. And as I say, it, it's, an, it's a, an, an NA NHS tool that is shared across all organisations. I don't think all organisations have taken it up, but for Ardash, which was the organisation that I worked in, it worked worked really well. So that was one area I wanted to, to sort of talk to you about. If there's any questions, stop me as we go, go along, because as I say, I'm more than happy to sort of to answer them. So this, so th th this is the advantages and disadvantages of using the, the electronic staff record. This, the staff can access it remotely. They can access it when they're on, on nights because invariably on mental health wards, it is quiet at night. You do have patients who obviously have to be observed on a one-to-one -one basis, but, but the majority of the time, the staff do have some time and, and they're allowed, able then to remotely access as the training. So you don't have to come off the job because our dash... It stands for Rotherham, Dongster and South Humber, NHS Foundation Trust. I think it's one of the longest titles of an NHS organisation. But we are a big organisation, have services in Yorkshire, North and South Yorkshire, and have services in Manchester. So for staff to have to come from Manchester, and we used to bus them in, you know, it's, it's a day. If you go to Manchester from Doncaster and on the way back, believe me, it's a day. So they can access it remotely. They don't have to come into the education department. They're 
able to look at their individual training complaints. So they, they know when they're coming out of date. They, they, they know that in, you know, I'm going to be out of date in two months' time, so I better get booked on or I better have a, have a look at this. Um, and they can access it at their own convenience as well. And they can access it remotely, so they can access it from, from home. We do a lot of agile work in, in, the, in that, this, that organisation. I still can't get out of my head that I don't work for them anymore. But, but I don't work for them anymore. But um, a lot of agile working, we have commun community trust. So obviously um, district nurses, um, health visitors, school nurses, uh, and, the, and the community psychiatric nurses work, you know, work remotely. So they, they, they can access it. And the NHS organisation can, can look at their overall compliance. One of our um, admin team who managed uh, the... Um, uh, um, ESR, she would send out the compliance on a daily basis. It, you know, it's it's a lie. It's it's live data. It's that it's that good. I suppose the disadvantage is that, is that um, staff don't always get the dedicated study time because the expectation is that they will do it while they're doing the day job, and that sometimes is difficult. If you think about if you're managing a busy ward and you go into your office to try and do your IG training, and then there's knocks on the door, you know. So, so it's it's not being able to have that dedicated time, and having protected time in work as well, because the expectation is now that you do that in your own time. And certainly for other NHS organisations, the expectation is that new employees will have done their mandatory training before they even start, you know, in their role. And it doesn't suit all adult learners. Not everybody likes to learn that way. You know, a lot of people, especially sort of people who are a bit kinesthetic, like to be there, like to be somebody in front of them, you know, like to have that sort of touching and feeling and, and, and being a, in being a classroom. So it has its disadvantages for some, some learners as well. We have had some difficulties, if we, you know, with staff who've got dyslexia who, who, who have difficulty reading anyway, but we have put some, some support in for them. So, um, so that's the that's the SR in a, in a nutshell. Another thing I wanted to talk to you about was PPQA, and I know I know this doesn't happen in London because, as I say, I've had the mentor students, and they think this is amazing, but it's something that it, that sort of North of England NHS have developed, and it's obviously got financial implications. There are. Um, uh, obviously quality assurance around st student support learning. So student nurses, student uh, AHPs, psychologists, whoever, who spend, you know, the, the part of their, their time as a student in the university also spend out, part of their time outside. Certainly for student nurses, they spend 50% of their time in the university and 50% on placement. So what we were... And, and the, the circuit, we call it the placement circuit, it's got bigger and bigger more student more student nurses uh, coming into into positions getting you know getting on courses and because we we were starting to look at more agile working and closing wards because patients as you know don't stay in hospital anywhere near the time that they used to when i trained in the 60s Nobody went home until they were fit enough to do the, the trolley with the drinks on at night. And when you were fit enough to do around and serve the hot chocolate and the, and the cocoa, then you could go home. So we did a lot of rehab, you know, in, in that time. Now, you have your surgery in your home, your home the next day. So there aren't the opportunities, as many opportunities for students, because we don't have as many, many ward placements. So we're looking more at private um, sort of institutions as well, sort of private care homes, looking at working much more with social care. So what they've, what, what they've developed in, in Yorkshire is a tool so that all the information about where all the placement areas that are open go, are there for the students to be able to see. So the universities, obviously, it's their responsibility to look at where the place where the students are going to be placed. But if I was a very new new student nurse and it was my first placement, I would I can just I can remember what it was like on my first placement. 
I'd be absolutely petrified. But to be able to go in with some information about that area so they can go onto this, um, uh, onto this website, they can have a look at where they're going to be based, they can have a look at the type of ward, what kind of patients there are, how many patients there are, what the illnesses are so they can start and prep up what those illnesses are. They've got a contact, they know who their mentor is and they can make contact with that um, uh, with that mentor what we have developed is because it was initially for student student nurses but we've now developed it because i'm sure you're very aware there are much you know more sort of roles coming in uh, nursing associates apprenticeships into nursing <clears throat> they've you know even looking at apprenticeships into um into the medical fraternities there are lots of different things happening now so we've we've developed the ppqa to, so we know exactly who is a student in that organisation and where they are on that day. And it's really good for quality assurance. So those are the standards around, around placement. And as I say, I, you know, I could go into them, but we obviously haven't got, got that time to do that. So, that, so that's PPQA, and we absolutely love it, and the students absolutely love it. And I said I was talking to the mentor prep students um, yesterday, and they were saying, oh, I wish we had that. It'd be so, so good. So then I wanted to talk a bit more now on the next sort of couple of um, topics around actually mental health. Um, mental health is very interesting. As I say, I'm, I'm, I was a general nurse. We, did, we were even adult nurses then. We were general nurses in the 60s. But I've worked in mental health uh, trust for, me, for many years. And um, so I think I'm a bit, bit knowledgeable about, about, about mental health now. But I think mental health has still got a stigma, unfortunately. And one in three of us will have some mental health illness at some point in, in time. I am living with my youngest daughter, who keeps coming home. I keep sending her away and she keeps coming home. She's a qualified nurse. She works in a hospice, but she has got um, OCD, really bad OCD, to the point that she's got a thing at the minute about smells. And I have had my coat to the cleaners every single week for about three months because she can smell something on my coat. I even did a smell test with the staff that I work with in BPP. So I know how difficult it is working with someone who has some mental health issues, but she works full time. She's, she works in a, in a local hospice. She, she manages a, you know, a large team and, and she works very well, but she does need need support. And one of the things that she was able to access is around um, in, in internet is sort of having a rather than having to go to someone who will do cognitive behavioral therapy that she could do that on online so we can do cbt cognitive behavioral therapy now via computers okay so there are massive waiting lists for talking therapies talking therapies works really really well it's amazing really i mean talking to each other helps doesn't it you know, we can t we, we talk to each other and it certainly helps. But the waiting list is so long because it's a bit like it's the in, in thing. And the waiting list is, is very, very long. And, and some mental health problems around depression, anxiety and stress, these, these service users can can still work you know they don't and and if you think if you've got a busy job and then you're having to leave two hours to go to the hospital to see the psychologist or the psychiatrist you know it, it's it's quite hard for people who are trying to continue to have a a normal life and research shows it's effective it is as effective as face to face. There's some national research just being done, and I've been involved in doing a, a, some local research, which is just about to be published, on uh, the benefits, really, of, of CCBT in, in relation to to face to face. Because what happens, the um, the NHS will only pay for a, a number of sessions. So you can have five sessions with a therapist. But what happens if you need 10 or you need 20 or what are you going to do then apart from pay privately? So this is a real, real benefit and it's free to, to NHS patients and it's a, re a real benefit. Obviously, the service users got to be uh, IT literate 
that helps. But we do go through the, the you know, the process uh, with them. So it's suitable for anybody who does not want to work with face to face with a therapist. And often, especially with um, service users who've probably got high profile jobs, probably don't want people to know. I know my Harriet. Nobody who works with my Harriet knows that she's that she's got OCD. They haven't got haven't got a clue, and she doesn't want them to know. So you know, and they don't need to. They don't need to because she manages her work really well. It's just as I say, she's got a thing about my coat at the minute. Mm -hmm. It's helpful for people who find it difficult to leave home if you've got agoraphobia or you've got social anxiety. You can't get out to see the therapist anyway. So being able to you know to do that, shorter waited times, mental health has always been the Cinderella service really always, and that sometimes. Yeah, it does bug me because having been a you know a general nurse and know what what's what's available, mental health we they they do miss out. But I know at the moment there's a big push on mental health services and that's absolutely brilliant. So it's much shorter waiting times. No need to travel. Don't need to travel to a specified location, and it's discreet and confidential. Nobody knows. Nobody knows you're going for a hospital appointment. Um, we, what we try to do, because it's very interesting, this, I think somebody should, should do some research on this, but, but nurses and um, uh, cl any clinicians who come into mental health tend to have either mental health issues or have history of it in their, in, in their family. When I was head of education, I managed a very large team, and I had three mental health nurses who had all had some issues. One's mum had taken her own, her own life. One had tried to take her own, her own life. And another one had had, where well, she had a baby at 16 and had him adopted and the impact of that. So they tend to, they, they tend to go to sort of that, that um, service for whatever reason. But if you are working in an NHS, NHS organisation and you are, and you are needing some therapy, you don't want to have that therapy in the organisation that you work in. So what we try and do is move them to, you know, to, to transfer them to another NHS organisation. But CCBT is absolutely amazing, really good. This is the exciting bit. This is the bit that I really want to share with you, and then I will shut up. And I know I've spoken fast, but I've got a lot of stuff to get through. When I came into this post 17, 17 years ago, I'd been a health visitor. I'd be, I've done paediatrics, I've done dialysis. If you've had a look at my bibliography, I've done everything. But I came in, uh, in, into um, a, a mental health uh, trust as head of education. And there was this, like, barrier that you don't have an illness. If you've got a mental health problem, you don't have anything wrong with you from your neck down. Like, that's somebody else's, you know, forget that. It's nothing to do with us. We just look after your head. And I kept thinking, this isn't right. You know, I thought we were teaching students about holistic sort of support and how, and looking at the patient as a whole. So, you know, you haven't just got a head in the bed, have you? You know, it's the rest of, rest of the body. So I decided that I didn't know how long I was going to stay in post. I probably was only going to stay in a couple of years because that's what I've done in the past. But I actually ended up staying 17. Um, and there were things that I wanted to bring in. And one was around cadetship which is now apprenticeship so that's really really exciting the other thing was about improving the mandatory training compliance but the third thing was around bringing in clinical skills bringing in a clinical skills lab looking at physical illness with mental health practitioners and I think they thought it were balmy you know I thought right yes right so so I was really fortunate because a few years ago, the NHS had quite a bit of money. They, they, we were in a good position and we could bid. We could bid for money. So I decided that I would put this very large bid in and change one of our training rooms in the education centre into a clinical skills lab. And surprise, surprise, they gave me the money. I was really surprised. So what we did, we started, we bought a mannequin, we bought um, blood pressure machines, we, we, we we, we changed it into a ward and we changed part of it into a patient's home. And, and it, I, as I say, it was absolutely amazing that we'd, we'd, we'd got this money. So then I thought, right, OK, I've got, I've got the place now. I've got the place now. What are we going to do? So we 
I, I didn't do this on my own, but I started with a, with a, a group of staff to look at how we could engage with mental health practitioners. This is psychiatrists, psych psychologists, nurses, AHPs, to, for them to have a look at the physical, actual look at physical illness of patients. So within Yorkshire, we have developed this RAMPS, and it's recognising and assessing medical problems in psychiatric settings. So it's about either using the mannequin or using actors. We have a, a guy, an actor that comes. Now, as I say, I'm not from from mental health. My f first ever uh, connection with the, with the mental health patient was when I was a third year student nurse in, in casualty, as we called it at the time. And we had this patient that had come in and they thought she was in a diabetic coma and I was asked to one to one her. And she wasn't in a diabetic coma at all. She'd taken some, some lethal drug. And she got up and she pinned me to the wall and I'm thinking, right now, what do I do? And I managed to get out of that situation, fortunately. But the, but I was scared. I was scared of mental health patients because I wasn't I wasn't comfortable with them. So over the years, working in mental health trust, obviously that that you know that's that's changed. But I think for mental health nurses, they're scared of a physical illness. They're scared of you know of things like vena puncture. They're scared of drip counters, and and if you look, if you ask them to look at a syringe driver, they've not got a clue what you're talking about. But they need to because mental health patients become physically ill as well. Of course they do. That of course, if physical health patients can become mentally ill, it's got to work the other way around. So what we do is we take the multidisciplinary team, and that is the consultant psychiatrists who were really reticent about coming, but they love it. They absolutely love it. And we take the whole team, we take the qualified staff, we take the healthcare assistants, and we put them in a scenario for a day, and we have actors that come in, and they pretend to be the patient. And it's absolutely brilliant. So as I say, we either use a mannequin or the actor to simulate patient response, and then we support the team to work together. So they can make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes because nobody's going to die because it's, it's, it's safe. And it emphasises the importance of, of team working. I'll very quickly just give you an example. The first time I went into one of these sessions, they had this guy who they thought was having a psychotic episode. And they, they were, there was everybody there and they were going to put him in a secure uni and he wasn't having it and he was what we call kicking off. I don't think that's a very medical term, but that's what we call it. And he was kicking off, this guy. And there were three of us, three of the trainers who were adult John and nurses. And we said, it's diabetic. It's going hypo. And all the, the psychiatrist was to get in the prescription out and he was going to give him this and they were going to do what they were going to do and they were carting him off into so going to section 136 him for you know which which they do for 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 patients and we kept saying giving him a banana you know give him something and in the end at the end of the session he actually that's actually was right he was it was going hypo but they didn't see it because they just looked at the, the mental health part so it's okay to to make a mistake when you've not got a real patient. It's not okay to make a mistake when you've actually got when you've actually got a patient. So that is it. I will shut up. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs> okay, so I think we've overrun a bit, haven't we? So I don't know if you if there's any questions that you want to uh, me to answer, I'll happily do so. Um, how does it work exactly the uh, computer CBT? How does it work? Yeah. Right. Well, well, it's a program. It's, it's, it's a it's a program that's been written by the um, the psychiatrist psychologist. So there's no there's no one actually on the other side. It's not like a, a Skype. No, no, it's actually there. It's a program that they go that they go through. So the patients would have to be able to read. Right? They would, and that's one of the difficulties we've had because I work in quite a Doncaster is quite a deprived area, mm -hmm. and uh, we have looked at um, if they do have some uh, some difficulties with reading and writing. We actually will work will work with them, but the majority of people who use it, to be fair, are professional people who 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 work. And this 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 suits them. 
you know, so yeah, you do have to be IT, IT literate, yeah, definitely. Okay.